and gentlemen. It's with a great deal of pleasure that we come into your living rooms this afternoon to discuss with you a revolution that is taking place in rural America. Now, with me on the panel this afternoon, <clears throat> I am a uh, parish over in Elkton, South Dakota. To my left is Pastor Hendrickson, who serves the parish over at Trent, South Dakota, and Jasper, Minnesota. And to his left is Pastor Brooklocker, who uh, operates in the wide open spaces up in uh, Florence, South Dakota. Now, as a little background for to set the stage for our uh, uh, informal discussion on this rural revolution, I would like to uh, present to you uh, a few moments of um, consideration that is basic to the whole issue. Number one, we in this country don't reflect often enough that uh, we are the inheritors of a family farm system of agriculture. And let me just take you back a little bit in the history of our country because this kind of thing is not taught in our ag colleges. It isn't given to our FFA boys, our, F, uh, our uh, uh, 4-H children. Uh, this uh, appreciation of our heritage isn't brought to their attention. So let's go back. You remember in the dawn of our history, we had, of course, a whole continent of land that had to be developed. We had millions of people over the, over the years who came to this country and they wanted land. Now, this land could have been given away, you know, like it was in South America, in huge estates and later on farmed by peons who never had a chance to own. Instead, as a nation, we accommodated the desires of the immigrant to settle on a piece of God's good earth. And at the time, as you know, of the uh, colonization of our country, there were about 95% uh, of our people were on the land. And after colonial days, when the immigrations increased, they spilled over into the Ohio Valley, the Indiana, Illinois. Land was given to them almost for uh, the, if they would develop it, it was theirs. We had the Homestead Act in 1862, which parceled out land in, in uh, portions of about 160 acres. So that after, uh, after about, uh, well, 100 years, we had the makings, the basis of a family farm system. And then for another hundred years, as a nation, we supported by national policy, we supported uh, and encouraged the uh, living of these people on lands of their own. And like Bishop Bartholomew said in summarizing this whole thing that he develops in one of his works, he says, we finally had in the Midwest the greatest concentration of millions of people on land of their own that the world has ever seen. It never happened before. Now, one of the points I want you people in the audience to realize is this. If we have a family farm system today, if we have inherited such a system today, it's due to a, a happy set of circumstances indeed, but it's also due to the fact that we had national policy supporting a family farm system. Now, as a Catholic, I can simply quote Pope John, who had something to say about this. He pointed out that when you look at agriculture from a worldwide point of view, he said that you will discover that there is a vast diversity in the enterprise involved in the production of food and fiber. But he makes this point that he says, if we consider this whole matter of agriculture from the viewpoint of, of nature and the family, that we should seek to achieve a family farm system of agriculture wherever possible. Now, in this land of ours, we don't have to achieve it. We have inherited it. And who will say that it has not provided an abundance of food and fiber to the nation at a cost uh, that is better than any other nation in the world? Now, there is another aspect to agriculture. You can't use the word agriculture anymore because we have two agricultures in this country. And I want to say a word about the other agriculture that not only is coming, it's already here. Now, one of its spokesmen is a man by the name of uh, Earl Koch. He's uh, the vice president of the Bank of America. He had a great deal to do about the Eisenhower Benson farm uh, policy and program. He's very influential among agribusiness people. And in a talk to uh, an influential group of people in Chicago about I think it was four years ago, he made this statement. He said, there is dawning in America 
a new dynamic type of agriculture. And then he went on to explain what this new agriculture was. And he outlined it under three points. He said, number one, it'll be an agriculture that will have continuity of operation. And by that he meant it'll be a corporate structure. Number two, he said, it'll be an agriculture that will not uh, operate on the earnings of the enterprise. In other words, it'll, it'll have its capital or financial resources from the outside. It'll be absentee money. And then he mentioned also that it will involve the, the ownership of vast tracts of land. Now, up to this time, you know, in this country, that has been impossible because we've had about six million, back in the 30s, we had six million squatters out here, you know, sitting on this land with legal titles to it, and big money and corporate structures could not take it over because families were living on that piece of God's good earth. Now, this type of uh, agriculture, as contrasted with the family-owned, family-operated and managed unit, involves three things, outside money, corporate structure, and hired management. Now, you might say, well, that's nice uh, theory, but uh, what it doesn't have any practical value. Well, you look around today, if you have your eyes open at all, and you will discover that the family farm enterprise in agriculture is being seriously questioned, it is being challenged, and uh, many influential people are writing it off. Let me just give you a, a, a little, uh, uh, some of the propaganda with which you are being brainwashed. You read uh, Post Magazine the, a short time ago. What does it say? Goodbye, Farmer Tuttle. Goodbye, you're gone. You read the uh, Reader's Digest. What does it say? The disappearance of the family farm. Pick up your Boy's Life Boy Scout magazine of a recent issue. The same concentration on the new agriculture. Now, uh, this is what is being predicted. They're telling us, some influential people, that we can still get rid of two million more farm families. And uh, if that happens, my dear people, remember, that land is still going to be tilled. And the financial structures of that of those new or remaining uh, pieces of uh, enterprise and agriculture are, go are going to involve investments of hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. The millionaires are going to be doing the farming. Now, we have two agricultures, a family enterprise that we've always had. We have the other agriculture, the corporate structure, outside money and, and, and hired management. And the question that you people out there in the audience are going to have to decide. The farmers can't decide it anymore. They're only about 7% of the population, and they are politically ineffective. But you are going to have to decide what enterprise in agriculture do you want to produce the food and fiber of the nation. Now, we believe, as clergymen here, that this social institution of the family on, on the land is valuable not only to produce your food and fiber. We, be, we believe it's also a valuable social institution that deserves to be continued as it has been uh, encouraged to continue in the past. Now, uh, with that little background, uh, let's just have a little informal discussion pursuing this kind of thing. And first of all, I'd like to ha have Pastor Brooklocker uh, kind of address himself to this question. Do you think that this trend must continue, that these forebodings about the disappearance of the family farm have to take place? Well, uh, Father Miller, it wasn't uh, too long ago, I think a little over a year ago in my life, that the uh, earnest conviction came to me that changes and trends involve the decisions of people, and that uh, changes and trends can be faced, and that there is something that we can do about it, and that we, uh, we do not have to let uh, the so-called doctrine of adjustment or the doctrine of adaptation rule the day so that we don't uh, have anything, uh, there isn't anything that we can do about it. Now, uh, this, this spelled out for me that uh, instead of so much emphasis being placed on adapting to this, like in uh, getting rid of more farmers, uh, closing our, our schools and closing our churches and... Uh, and uh, subsidizing this and subsidizing uh, that, and especially in agriculture, 
that there was an area of prevention. And that uh, this theme, at least in my mind and in my study, lead boiled down to one thing, that because we were losing all of these things in the rural area, that it could be traced directly to the loss of the farmer's income or a fair price paid to agriculture. And that this was where we ought to begin. All right, now how are we going to begin in this area in order to stop the trend? Let's work on that angle. Well, if I would follow closely here again, I would say that we must uh, stop attacking the symptoms that manifest themselves, uh, and we must begin to deal with the causes. And, uh, and I think this is here where we can uh, spell out uh, some of these things. And one of the things, uh, to me, uh, is, first of all, a historical understanding for example, the, uh, a corporate farming structure of agriculture as over against the family farm system. Now, I think if, if anyone will honestly study history, we'll have to come up with this fact that, that um, where uh, agriculture has been taken over and put into the hands of a few people, uh, that uh, this has been toward and down the road of a disintegration of that nation or civilization. Whereas, on the other hand, that uh, the family farm system uh, has uh, proven itself down through history to bring, uh, to bring about an effective uh, social structure in which people can live. Well, fine, Pastor. Uh, Pastor Henderson, would you address yourself to that, uh, more of the moral aspect of it again? I would like to uh, read from the fifth chapter of Isaiah where Isaiah, facing a similar situation over 700 years before Christ, had these words, which he said are God's words to you people of Israel. Woe to you who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no more room, and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitants. For 10 acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield but an effort. Now, Isaiah is saying here that because of the appropriation of the land from the people of Israel in contrary, uh, contrary to the will and to the, to the word of, of your God, you are going to bring a destructiveness upon the people. It was a law of the Israelites, of the Hebrews, that every 50 years there would be a year of jubilee in which the land would go back to the people who had originally owned it, uh, to the families that it belonged to. We have the same thing happening here in America. It's happened in other countries in the world. And today we are using the excuse of efficiency and technology. We are saying that one man using the tools, the machinery that has been developed, can produce more than a large number of small farmers, that small farming is inefficient. Modern technology and corporate capital can take care of the agricultural needs of our land. And we can move these three and a half million farmers off of the land. Um, I will say that probably one man can produce more than a number. He can do it with itinerant, with exploited, with migrant labor, with all of the evils connected with that particular system. But one man with his machinery cannot make our land produce more. And Isaiah said here that your vineyards and your farms are going to begin to produce less because the man who is, whose primary obligation is to his corporate uh, bosses, he is concerned about profit. He is not concerned about people. He is not concerned about the world. He is not concerned about prices. He is, or the land, God's land. 
but he is concerned only about pleasing those who hire him. They tell us that here in South Dakota, they expect within a few years that the average farm will have an assessed valuation of about $3 million. Now, that simply means that no individual farmer or farm family will be able to raise this kind of money to establish this kind of farm. Today, it is becoming more and more difficult for any young farmer to start unless he has a great deal of help from his father. There you are so that, You had that quotation of uh, Eric Severide. I found mm -hmm. that very interesting. Yeah, Just to indicate how, how broad spread this attempt to uh, kind of brainwash the American people against the continuation of a family farm structure. He said, uh, Eric Severide said in a television broadcast, in 15 short years, no, no more than 5% of our people will make their living directly from the soil. They will, nearly all of them, be connected with big scale, big capital, mechanized corporate farming. This transformation cannot be avoided. It can only be made as smooth as possible to reduce human suffering, to reduce human suffering. Now, the suffering is going to take place not only on our, with our farmers, but it's going to take place with every town and every village and every city in the state of South Dakota and in the rest of the Middle West here. The loss of services, culture, we are going to turn our Middle West into a cultural wasteland. Our schools are going to suffer, our businesses are going to suffer, our health facilities are going to suffer, our recreational facilities are going to suffer. I would like, now, uh, okay, we've got the picture, I think. Now, let's uh, get down into this area uh, pointed by this question. Uh, we've been told that these, these are the trends. You're not going to stop them. All right. But we feel that they can be stopped because I, it's my conviction, for instance, that uh, if farmers continue to act in the way sociologists have ob observed them, acting in the past, I have no hesitation to say that all these dire predictions are going to take place. Now, where is this area where the, the farmer will have to change? Let's uh, have a few uh, words on that. Well, if I could uh, direct some attention to that, I think basically, it's my belief here, that the farmer basically must um, make the adjustment and in this case, it would be fine. From, from uh, individual, independent action to group action. That is, uh, well, in Genesis, the eighth chapter, God, God promised the farmer, or God promised man, that as long as the earth remained, seed, time, and harvest would not fail. As, far, as long as he runs his farm, operates his farm, and the inside of the fence line, uh, he should be able, under God, to manage it and to, uh, to be successful. But today we have this, this complex marketing structure. And, uh, and uh, well, this is where uh, I found an answer to this question which has lingered with me for, uh, for many years from my childhood. And that is, is farming a gamble? And, uh, and uh, this is the conclusion that I've come to that... Uh, it isn't that farming is a gamble, but that farmers are gambling as long as they take their production and market it as individuals in this complex marketing system which we face. In other words, it comes down to a moral issue. To a, a moral issue. issue. That uh, farmers are not isolated little units among themselves, but they have a moral responsibility to work one with another. Like uh, we read in the scriptures, bear ye one another's burdens, right. and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, uh, the farmer must realize that in this society in which we live, one of the expressions of his love for his neighbor is the necessity to operate together with him right. for the building of structures that will command for himself a decent price. Right. And I like to recall the statement that Pope John, who got very specific on this issue, he pointed out that uh, since, fa uh, since family units in land or on the land are so small and scattered, the vital necessity, the moral responsibility that he has to associate with his fellow farmer 
and also even gets this specific that he must build a structure in society for himself that he can command a, a just price for the labor of his children himself and his family and it's in this area where uh, uh, where religion must operate in the lives of individual farmers would well, you want to say another word on that uh, pastor Henderson the the farmer <clears throat> Whether he belongs to a farm organization or not, whether he belongs to any one of a number of different farm organizations, and we find that some of them belong to three and sometimes four. Which is good. That each one of these has something to contribute to the betterment and the well-being of our rural communities, our, our, our Midwestern life here. But that uh, we cannot, he cannot any longer believe that it is only in his way and by himself that he is going to preserve his life. Too often he figures, if I can keep alive, I, I don't much care what happens to my neighbor. It's too bad if he has to leave. Um, and it isn't only the farmer. It's, it's the banker. It's the man on Main Street. It's the doctor. It's the teacher. It's the, the individual who lives in our towns and our cities who serves the, services these farmers who must be concerned also. There okay. must be a collective understanding that it is together that we stand or that we fall. In other words, uh, the farmer himself is not going to solve his own problem completely. He's go it involves uh, uh, an ordering of our agricultural sector of our whole economy, which is of concern to the whole nation, so that the whole nation must be involved in this, in this matter. But I think we can say, and on this, uh, in, uh, in the light of this particular program, uh, that we are going to stop these trends, or the farmer is going to begin stopping these trends, only when he begins to work together with his neighbor as he has never done before in the marketing area. And here, I, I have no uh, quarrel at all with, uh, with uh, admiring any group of farmers, whether it's NFO or any other group, that advocate a putting into practice of the Christian uh, command of man working with his fellow man for his own betterment to build a structure that will command a decent price for agriculture. That's why I can, uh, whether if a man's in Farmers Union or, or even Farm Bureau or NFO, striving to get a decent price for his products, he's to be commended. Right. And uh, I, I, I find this too, that farmers, with all the press practically against them as far as justice for their cause is concerned, they need a lot of encouragement in this, uh, in, in this whole effort. <clears throat> I, th I think that is, that's our moral responsibility. Uh, um, I, like, uh, I like the statement that Carl Wilkins uh, has uh, said, and he made this in a, uh, in a statement, in a personal letter to me, and in some of his other materials. And that is, um, and I think we as all people, American people especially, need to realize this, that, that it is a sin for us to permit God's blessings to be undervalued at the marketplace. And uh, sometimes uh, a Christian or we ministers may be criticized at this point and say, well, what business is, uh, is this of ours? What concern is it? And I believe here is a moral responsibility. And this is the statement that, uh, that I have come to myself and that as a minister, uh, thinking in concern on behalf of the people that I serve and, and all other people, it is just as much my concern and the Christian's concern uh, to see that the farmer and all laborers are justly rewarded or to help and to encourage them, as you mentioned in their labors from the soil to the pocketbook as well as from that offering plate to charity. And uh, right here, I think that uh, this, is, this is stewardship, and I think uh, a big area of stewardship. The religious uh, aspect of this farm problem, uh, I don't think can be overestimated, and that's why uh, I think the clergy have a very definite responsibility in this area. I remember years ago, about 40 years ago, reading a quotation of Archbishop O'Hara, who helped establish the Rural Life Conference many years ago. And he made this statement, and he said, uh, when the farmer loses his sense of religion, that is, his love for God, and his love and concern for his fellow man, including his fellow farmer, 
he will lose his land. And the more you look at this thing in the light of that uh, teaching, uh, the more you realize that it is true. Because uh, uh, if he acts like uh, an isolated atom, yeah. well, God didn't make him that way. So he's going to suffer by acting in that ungodly manner. So I'd like to just indicate to you farm people, this, whatever your religious persuasion is, you have a moral responsibility to ask yourself, what am I doing in this organized society of building a structure so that my children, when they labor and when I labor for my family, that I can have a just return for the contributions that I make to society? Yes. Uh, Father Miller, isn't it interesting? Uh, I imagine in your, your prayer book, you have prayers uh, in this manner also, but in our hymn book, we have a prayer in the front part of our hymn book. God grant them the just rewards for their labor. And yet many of our Christian people can pray this prayer and then the, the other six days of the week walk out into society and, uh, and even pray for the food on the table and at the same time ignore the undervaluing of God's blessings at the marketplace. To me it's a, it's a dire inconsistency. Uh, it's like the old ditty where it says, Mr. Business went to Mass, he never missed a Sunday, but Mr. Business went to hell for what he did on Monday. <laughs> and, uh, Pastor Henderson. Yeah. Um, here again, uh, this um, division between the concern of, of the farmer. Uh, most of our farmers are concerned. Sometimes they're not concerned about their neighbor, but that so many of the other segments of our society do not express this same concern for the farmer, uh, believing somehow or other that, uh, that the city of Sioux Falls or the town of Flandreau or so forth will, will, will manage to get along no matter what does happen to the farmers. Um, the, the ministers uh, sometimes feel that their only concern is for the spiritual well-being of their people, but the spiritual well-being of their people is very intricately tied up with the financial and the cultural and the social well-being of their people. Our educators somehow believe that their educational institution is going to continue to exist no matter what happens to the people who in our area are basically responsible for the, the, the maintenance of that system. And we out here in this, we are, as it were, in the very heart of a family farm system. And if we don't become genuinely concerned about it and make every effort that we can to call to the attention of the nation what's involved in the dismantling right. of a family farm system in, in preference for this other agriculture that we spoke about, who else is going to do it? Yeah, we, uh, and we've got to do it with the united voice. We've got to do it with the united voice. And here we can just touch on it, but uh, as you can see, folks, this is an, ec you might call it an ecumenical uh, a group here of different religious persuasions. But in this particular area of um, each one of us making a contribution to rural America for its preservation, we all have uh, and can find a genuine responsibility of working together. So we have before us, or we hope we presented before you, uh, the two agricultures, our traditional heritage of family farming and the other agriculture uh, with its uh, absentee capitalism and we hope that you will assist us in making the right choice. Thank you very much for being with us.